Good. All righty. Good. How good must it have felt, but seeing all of those offensive guys you were missing last year in the line and the quarterback yeah. and Blake getting back out there, just the significance of that and having them from the start of camp going forward. No, it's been awesome. They've been part of it for a while, obviously. So they're all at different phases throughout the offseason program with their uh, their rehab, but uh, it's pretty awesome to see those guys walk out, see the big uh, the big three, the big guys walk out together. Uh, Dak, obviously, Blake. Uh, you know, there's a lot of guys that have been through some stuff last year, and so I think we're in a really good place. How anxious were you to see Dak yesterday, just the, the first training camp practice? Yeah, it's good. Uh, obviously, like like anyone who goes through those type of uh, injuries, just starting to get 11 on 11 is big, just because there's you got to get used to the trash kind of <laughs> underneath your feet and stuff, and that's natural. You know, when you have a lower injury. You just got the more you get around those type of guys, uh, you know, with the offense and the defense lined together, I think it's just going to make them more and more comfortable and get get ready to roll. Were you cognizant of that when you were coming back from your ankle deal? Like, did it take you a while to not be mindful of what's at your feet? Yeah, I think you're just you're just you know unconsciously aware of it. Obviously, you know, it, it, you're it's your uh, the thing you've focused on for so many months, and so naturally, you have some attention to it. Uh, but I think, obviously, the more you're just around this thing, the more you get comfortable. There's going to be a guy who falls, and you're going to be fine. And there's going to be another guy who falls, and you're going to be fine. And the more you do that, uh, I think the more comfortable he's going to get. And eventually, it kind of disappears from your thought process, and, and you're playing ball. Jack was talking about how he's eager to play in the preseason, and he almost wouldn't mind getting hit, kind of just not, you know, standing back up after contact. Is that something that you can relate to coming off an injury as a quarterback? You probably don't want to get hit too hard. But no, 100%. There's a great, it's a weird thing about quarterbacks. I think it's, it's a great feeling the first time you get hit. Uh, there's just something about it that, you know, you got hit, you got back up, and now now let's go play real football again. And obviously, uh, we've done a lot of stuff up to this point that's close to real football, but uh, we got to continue to build to that. And eventually, there's contact a part of it, and we got to be ready to handle that as well. Is there anything you're watching him to, to monitor to see if, well, this, this changed his mechanics in any way, or normally he would do this a different way before, or, is he, or have you moved past that already? I think we're totally past that. Uh, mechanically, there, there's nothing that we're uh, focused on from that standpoint. I think it's more the, the day-to-day grind of practicing and training camps and getting accustomed to the workout stuff and just seeing where he's at each and every day, uh, you know, if he has anything that comes up because of that. But uh, nothing really so far, and, you know, Britt and Jim and those guys, they handle that, and... You know, it's just constant feedback. Given the injury, does Dak still want to run? And given the $140 million or $160 million, <laughs> does Jerry still want him to run? I think at the end of the day, uh, that's part of what's made Dak a really good football player. Obviously, there's an element of being smart and understanding situational football. But uh, I think it's, it's kind of foolish of us to take that away from him. Uh, he can still make plays with his legs. Uh, you know, he, he's got a runner's mentality at times and uh you know running someone over and trying to stiff arm people and that's still a part of them we just gotta find find where our situations are right and uh and play really good football and you know that, that's who he's always been and i think he needs to embrace that still you think there's a value to playing a physical style of football as a quarterback yeah cer- certainly i think uh at the end of the day you got to be able to move around in the pocket and, and certainly where the the nfl is right now with the the best the best in the league you got to be able to move around. You got to be able to play off schedule. You got to be able to make plays there, whether it's moving within the pocket, moving out of the pocket, still throwing, taking the run when they give it to you, scrambling for a first down. Uh, we still need all of that out of Dak. And uh, there's going to be a time and place. He's still going to have to run the football. Uh, we just got to be smart and acknowledge when, when those situations are best suited for us. Is there ever such a thing as too many weapons on offense? Uh, no, I'm never going to complain about that. <laughs> Trying to find a way to say yes, but no, uh, I'm gonna say no. Uh, no, I, I obviously we, I feel fortunate. Or I think we're in a great position where we are. Get our guys back healthy. We got a lot of versatility with our group, which I think is something we're really embracing right now. Is it one of those things where a team wants to focus on this? You have counterbalance, counteraction to what the defense is doing. Yeah, I think, I think it's having the ability to play multiple ways throughout the season. Um, there might come a game, Zeke. We need you 35, 40 carries. Team's giving it to us. We're going to be in big personnel. We're going to grind something out. You might say, hey, we need to spread this sucker out and be in four wide and play with both tight ends and try and spread this thing out. 
and we're going to throw it a bunch. We, we have to have the ability to play different styles of football. And I think where we are with, with our personnel, with multiple running backs we feel great about that can play on the field at the same time, multiple running uh, tight ends, obviously the receiving core people know, uh, I think we're in a really, really good place. What did you think of Zeke coming in lighter this, off, this season? Looks great. <laughs> Love it. Uh, I think just where his mind is, where his uh, approach has been all off season, it's been phenomenal, and uh, we love it. Do you see anything different? In, he said he worked a lot on the short area quickness miss. So how do you expect that to impact his game this year? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you know he looks quicker. Uh, that's probably the note everyone notices. But uh, I, I think he's going to be a versatile player, and, and that's one thing we've been trying to view this whole off season approach. It. We got a lot of the same guys. We've had a system in place for a little while that everyone feels comfortable with. Now it's where do we evolve it? Where do we build it? And uh, guys being versatile is a big thing for us. Guys being able to line up in different positions, line up uh, wherever we can create matchups and, and go from there. Was his worst critic when it came to when it came to his performance last season. Beyond the ball security, which improved as the season went on, what do you think he really needed to build off of and address coming off of last year? Yeah, I think ball security, and uh, obviously that's that's the big focus. And then, you know, we went through all challenges as a, as a group as a whole, and so. Uh, I think there's just an opportunity to reevaluate, reestablish some things that uh, that he's great at, that this offense line's great at. I think, uh, and build on some new opportunities that we can continue to grow on. We don't want to stay stay the same. We're not trying to be the same offense we were in 1920. We're creating 2021, and there's going to be different flavors and different things thrown in there, and we're going to have some fun doing it. Given the difference between you know training camp practice as opposed to game planning during the season and that type of stuff, what's do you have an opinion about what's the most important thing to get down while you're out here practicing in this way? Yeah, we're trying to establish the right way, right way to play, the way we want to play. We're going through an installation process where we're installing certain things. There's going to be themes to each day, right? Whether it's a third down emphasis, a red zone emphasis, uh, maybe a personnel emphasis. Uh, so each day is going to have some sort of approach to it. And uh, ultimately, once we get through those installations, we start getting in these preseason games, then we're starting to hone in on uh, specifically what we want to look for uh, as we go to the season and uh, what, whatever our personnel strengths are, what we want to approach those first few games with. Did you have a time last year where you walking through the locker room, walking through the training room, and you saw all those guys in there and just kind of said, I'm sure you can't play? <laughs> <laughs> they were hanging out with Brett and Jim a lot. So, uh, yeah, no, certainly we miss those guys. Uh, hopefully we don't have to deal with one of those again. When Blake was injured, were there – certain concepts of your offense, route combinations, what have you, that you just had to kind of throw out for the rest of the season because without Blake, you really couldn't quite do them? I think there's naturally a concern for it just because we had such high hopes for what Blake could could provide for us last year. Uh, his ability to stretch the team vertically. And uh, the fortunate thing for us was Dalton came in and became such a great talent for us and a uh, valuable piece for us. And so uh, we're fortunate. You know, we still think the same things about Blake. And Dalton's got a year like like he had last year that uh, we can put those two guys out on the field and feel really, really good with where we're going. People often point to the jump players make from their first to second year. With that in mind and, and what you've seen from C.D. Lamb this offseason, what about his development? What what level do you expect him to be able to take it to this season? Yeah, um, that second year is huge for those guys. Uh, just the mental side of it and the confidence that goes with that, that you know, you know exactly what you're doing. You can go play, play fast. Obviously, uh, last year with the compressed offseason, he played a lot in the slot, and obviously we want to move him around a lot more. And so uh, hopefully we, that provides us the versatility to put those guys around in different positions, create matchups, put guys uh, where we want them to be uh, to hopefully be successful. And, and CD's one of those guys. He's going to play all over the field. He's going to line up everywhere across the field, and we're going to have fun doing it. Was that the benefit blessing? of having all those guys that move Amari in there, you move yeah. around, you move Michael around, have all those guys kind of be that versatile? Was it do for you? Yeah, it provides us great opportunities to uh, play matchup football. And, and Mike obviously talks about that, matchup football. The guys are going to have certain matchups, and the favorable matchups, we got to put them in the best position to be successful. Uh, we got different types of guys. We got strong, uh, strong, thick receivers. We got speed receivers. We got the versatility to put those guys in different positions and create those matchups. Blessing in disguise, I mean, with Amari not being out there, you know, you yeah, yeah. Obviously, there, there's always a value uh, for different guys. When when a guy's not there, someone else is going to get reps. We, we've been able to get CD out there. Uh, we we're a little low. Let Tony go out there and play some receiver. 
Uh, if we need Zeke out there, Zeke can line up anywhere. We have no problem with him. He, he knows this offense inside and out. And so, uh, you know, we feel very fortunate with what we've been able to develop this offseason. Kellen, given that you've got your system in place, you've got your guys and pretty much knew it was coming in, what did the last six weeks look like for you? And how much were you preparing game by game? Was it, okay, we did this last year and it didn't work? Take us through it. Yeah, this summer? Yeah, I think just uh, just honing in on exactly what we want to do. Uh, at the end of the day, training camp's really limited. There's really not many practices. How many have we got? 13 or something out here? You guys know it better than me. Uh, but there's not many practices, and so you got to be very specific on what you what you can get. There's there's tons of thoughts and ideas. You'd love to get to this. You'd love to get to that. But you got to hone in on exactly what can we accomplish out here. And then in the back of your mind, you know, there's things that are going to come up later in the training camp as we're in, when we're back in Frisco. Uh, throughout the season, things that we want to address at some point, but uh, you just got to hone in. I think that's the constant battle for for myself, at least. There's so many ideas and thoughts. You got to constantly try and tighten that thing up so we can continue to play fast. Kevin, what did you learn about yourself as a coach last year as you dealt with the many injuries to this offense? Yeah, I think just handling uh, handling the different changes and adjustments you have to do throughout the throughout the year. Obviously, my first year we were fortunate; we played fairly healthy. Uh, I think the tackle spot we had a little bit, you know, in 19 we had a tackle situation a few times, but uh, just having to be able to play in different personnel groups throughout a game that uh, something may come up, you may lose a guy, and you got to be able to adjust. And obviously, you know, Dak went down, we had to adjust a little bit. Um, so I think just being able to play the adjustment game is something that I feel like I grew on. You don't seem like the type of guy that would love uh, cameras being behind the scenes, getting all your meetings and things like that, but maybe you are. Um, what do you think of having hard knocks around? They're going to be obviously in the meetings like that, seeing you behind the scenes. Yeah, I'm probably not going to be the star. I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's been good. I, I don't think we've had an issue with this. It's, it's been a uh, it'll, it'll probably be a fun thing for everyone. I think everyone handles it the right way, and uh, we enjoy it. Thank you, Kellen. Yep. Kellen. Good. I, uh, before we got uh, rolling today, um, just a little bit with a heavy heart with a uh, good friend who passed and Greg Knapp. And I've known Greg for uh, over 20 years, and um, the NFL lost a, a good coach and a, a hell of a guy. He was, uh, he was funny. He loved to talk shit at practice, which you guys probably wouldn't know. He was so clean and buttoned up on stuff. But I learned a lot from him as an assistant coach watching him. Um, this was a pro's pro. I can remember um, we were at the Niners together. It was my first NFL job. And Seeing him, the way he took notes, there's Bill Walsh speaking. I was like, can I have a copy of that? And so from that point on, I um, made it a habit, you know, kind of through the years of taking notes of coaches and so topics and things that I've gone through. And you'd be surprised through the years, you know, the old notes that you found, whether it was through Mooch or Nick Saban or, you know, Pete Carroll, through the years. And uh, that came from Napper, you know, about a guy who was on his details and 
talk about standards of a professional and smart. So uh, I'm going to miss him like crazy. I love the guy. And so um, it was tough. So I appreciate the number of texts that everybody sent out. So thanks a bunch. And with that, I'm ready to let it rip and answer some questions for you guys. Brought up note-taking. And Mike told us about you teach them how to take notes. And Kazi as well. Used to run DMC. Which song is it? <laughs> Man, nothing stays inside anymore, huh? I get it. So um, what I did, I, I did do a, an exercise on note taking with them, and and the purpose was, um, you, you know, learning is a superpower, but note taking is a big part of that, and you can't write every word that I say. And so I said, you're, I'm going to, I'm going to say over a hundred words a minute, and so you can write ten to twelve. So I played an old song, Sucker MCs by run DMC because I knew every word so I could sing along as it was going and so the what we did is I said All right, we have a little competition here I want you to write down every word that you hear you know and so okay they started they heard the beat and then as it started you know you saw them frantically go and then we had a little competition to see who could remember you know which lines and so uh, the winner had like two lines right and my point was that I know the system inside out I'm gonna talk really fast you know, I grew up in New Jersey, I talk fast, and that's how it's going to be. So if you think you're going to sit here and write every word that I'm going to say and you're going to get it, you're mistaken. Because it's going to be how much you can, the main emphasis for it, and reviewing your notes, and how does it go, and learning something with the intent of teaching it back to somebody else. And that's a big deal because you learn it once when we're teaching it, and then, you know, teach it to a teammate, to someone else, so you really get it. And so uh, I think that's probably what uh, Kay's or Micah were probably referring to. Bar? <laughs> no, I can, yes, but will I? No. So uh, you had to ask. I understand. Like, you know, like you only know if, uh, yeah, no, uh, we're good. <laughs> you asked. I gave you a lot of good information on what we did. So uh, from there, that is not living to eternity with that. So thank you. Can you help you in, in teaching your defense to these guys here? That's a good question. Uh, it was how much was, uh, you know, DeMonte have an influence on uh, teaching the defense? I think he can probably decipher, you know, my language quickly, you know, to share, hey, what he might mean is this, this, you know, could look into this. But um, so much of, it's not the exact same system, you know, that uh, he was a part of in Atlanta. So there's quite a few things that are different. And I've been definitely impressed uh, by the way he started. But he has been a good uh, resource from he behind the scenes. Hey, here's what Q might mean in this, and so it may not be scheme related, but you know, in a situation, in a moment, a style of play, an attitude that we want to play with. So he can back me in a lot of ways. Scheme being one of them, but just a style and identity of how we want to play, uh, that would be another. Said so that you find different ways to kind of uh, teach things, and one of them was that he wasn't talking a lot early in his career. And you mic'd him up. And I did. Where do you where do you come up with these know. things? <laughs> yeah, so it's I did mic him up, and uh, so there was a good clip from John Lynch playing in the Super Bowl against um, the Raiders, and I thought that was a great example. He was telling Dexter Jackson, "Hey, this formation came up. This is about to happen," and he ended up getting an interception and scoring on the play, and you could hear him. Clearly, hey, Dexter, and he gave him the, you know, the signal of what it was going to be. I think it was like sluggo scene. And so he said it to him. He made the play, and you could hear John coming off the sideline. Was it sluggo scene? Was it then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what a powerful statement to say. Not only did he have his self organized, you know, in terms of what could happen, but if you really, really want to be a great teammate, you have to get to where you can communicate at a level that you can help the person next to you. And at safety, you have to be able to do it. It's non-negotiable. And so what we did with Kays in that moment was we mic'd him up and then I put his voice into every play. So while we were watching it, you know, you could hear him. So I wouldn't say it was as good as NFL films quality would be, but they got the point that it wasn't to the standard that it could be because the standard that I showed with John, that was championship standard. And so I wanted him to know there's another place to take your communication. Just making rip, Liz, right, left calls wasn't going to be enough. That wasn't going to cut it. And uh, lucky for him, the energy that he plays with, uh, you know, he was ready for the challenge to, to improve upon that. Is that something like you regulate? He's not a quiet guy. That would he'd be, yeah, you would not, yeah. Don't get, um, yeah, talking, confused with, <laughs> yeah, he loved to talk shit. He was, you know, full of energy. But the information that needed to happen at the moment by the play 
um, that could increase. So you're right that it wasn't that he was, you know, not saying anything, but I wanted to make sure the alerts, the calls, what you, what it could look like. Okay, so I can't you off. Can you, do you think you'll mic up any of your defenders this training camp? Yeah, I haven't brought it up to anybody here, and the communication's off to a good start. But uh, if I sense that that would be, um, I, that, that would probably be a trick to, to pull out of the back pocket for sure. How did you monitor Micah's time on as, as outside backer, as, as a defensive end? How do you gauge what he can handle right now? Yeah, and I think. What was nice about the spring of being able to, um, you know, to go through practices, you had a chance to see where some of his strengths lie. And so that was a, you know, a good piece for me as it went through the spring and into the summer that I could you know, negotiate and look at some packages to say, how would we feature him in some ways? And so I started that process yesterday. And not all of the ones that we'll try will be part of our permanent package, but I think that goes with looking into things to say, how would this look and go? Because some of these are gonna be new. But uh, to his credit, I, you know, he's worked hard. There's um, very few busts on his end. And so I think any time you have some adjustments, that's my job to make it easy to follow and easy to understand so he doesn't have to think. I don't want anywhere I thought, I thought, I want us to play really fast and really clear about how we're going to go after it because any hesitations and thoughts on defense uh, just slows you down, and he's got exceptional quickness to go, so I want to feature him in those ways. So you had Micah and obviously Jalen and late on the field together. How do you plan to use those guys? And what's the role? Of it? I know it's funny ball, all different type of things. But yeah, we're, we're fortunate that we do have a number of good players, and what thing I, I do is I want to make sure we have enough roles for guys that they can do their thing really well. So, you know, if you look at the linebacker spot, um, there's a number of guys that are going to have roles. They all won't be um, in the same packages together, but that doesn't mean there's not going to be significant roles, you know, for their team and how we're going to win. And I think winning at that position is going to come in a number of different ways. Who's got roles? How do we feature them? And third down, there's two minutes. There's first and second down things. So when you put all those together, now the game plan comes to life. But each day, you know, we're practicing guys at some different spots. Besides the Eagles, guys who long time starters got first round rookie, you know, playing the first round big. And accepting different roles, I guess, they've had to I think it still comes down to winning, you know, and so uh, the better the team does, the better we all do. And so having a real clear vision of the, your job, and you can nail that every single time, that's a really powerful statement. And so making sure the roles that you own, um, you'd bet on you every single time to get that job done. And so that's what we're working through now. I told the team when we got started on um, the 21st that there's 40 days and there's a lot we can accomplish in 40 days. That was going to be to the end of our you know, preseason against Jacksonville. And over those 40 days, I gave him some things that we wanted to measure during that time and system expertise and roles and um, our defensive identity. And it wasn't going to be done in one day or two days. It's going to take time to keep building that. And so and we're just one day into this. we got a lot of work to do and a long way to go. But um, the effort of what we want to do, you know, I'm pretty jacked about where that's headed. Being a big situational substitution guy, or do you see yourself doing more of that because of the versatile type of athletes you have? Here? Probably a little bit of both. I think all coaches would like that, but now that you have people that you can, um, you really want to take advantage of that, and especially um, in the front seven, you know, because now you can have, whether it's pass rush and big guys, we've got a lot of versatility now to do that, where, you know, some guys can, you know, really guard and cover, and other guys can rush. We've got some big guys that can hammer down in the run game. So if you have that, I definitely want to have the ability to play them in waves. And if you're at your best at the very end of the games, when you know, we all know in this league there's going to be a ton of two minutes, that's when you have to be at your best. And uh, by having waves of players, you allow, you know, guys who are fresher to play at the end. Um, that's a hell of an advantage. Is there a line to how much Micah, as a rookie, coming off a year where you play football, as a rookie, how much he can handle on his plate, and if so, how do you gauge where that line is located? Yeah, I think that the real line would be, um, you know, from the physical and the conditioning standpoint, because the mental part of it, he's done a nice job. So we got to make sure that we find that groove, like all ball players, you know, what's the right amount, you know, from practice times to reps in the game, and we'll, you know, measure that and learn more as we go. But for one day in, it's, you know, we're still learning that process, but uh, we'll find it. You know, because the guy works, he's got a good role for it. And if I felt it was getting too much, you know, on the volume side from learning, that's my job to back it off. And so we'll measure, you know, the amount of conditioning and the speed to go. And 
we don't have a you know a number on that yet, but we will. Individual instruction that you guys had after practice yesterday is that something that you plan on being something of a common thread during yeah, the camp? Yeah, it would be. Yep. Kind of the philosophy to those sessions. Well, I think um, when a player plays, you know, sometimes more than one position, um, there's some good guidelines that you want to follow to make sure that nothing really gets lost, you know, in the crack. In other words, if you were playing corner and you're always in with the corners, and you know, you're pretty much going to get all the information for that spot. But for him, where he's, you know, has some pass rush, you know, background, and he's got, you know, certainly the the big linebacker background. I can fill, you know, some of the space on the pass rush side. And so that's where a lot of our conversations will go. But it's also a good check-in to make sure where we're at, what we want to work on today, and be really deliberate on this day. These are the things we want to work on. On this day, these are the things that we're going to work on. I'm sure the guy that didn't take a conventional path to the NFL. Can, can you repeat the first part? Adam didn't take a conventional yes. path to the work. Understatement of the day. Yeah. How, how, did you get in, how did you guys get together and... Why was he the right guy for you to, to take Yeah, care? well, um, fortunately, uh, through a connection with this organization. And so um, he'd actually done an internship in Dallas. And uh, so a friend of mine, Jerome Henderson, had recommended him. And so he did a Bill Walsh uh, fellowship with us, ended up going through for the whole year. And I just thought he had a rare ability as a teacher. And so then for the next, you know, three seasons, you know, right there, right by my side in a number of ways at linebacker, at defensive line. And uh, he's made a remarkable you know, not transition into the NFL because that wouldn't be the right term, but a remarkable ascent into it. But with world-class teaching skills, that's, you know, you can know how valuable it is as a coach. Uh, he's an excellent motivator. So, um, yeah, he's got a, a huge future in this league. What's your vision? In Atlanta, you used your first-round pick on the court. You took the cape and the and you passed on Trevon Diggs. What are you seeing from Diggs here and, and any possible reason why you guys didn't take him down there? Uh, no reason why, you know, just as you're, you know, going through the normal evaluation process, but, um, you know, low in a long history, you know, of that position, man, have I been impressed by Diggs. Um, his competitiveness, his length, his, I knew he had excellent ball skills, but sometimes you just, you still need to be around somebody to really appreciate it. You know, there's something you can see something on tape and say, oh, that's good. But when you see him in person and you see the, you know, the, he, he catches and you don't really hear it. You know, there's a, a very easy, not one-handed back, you know, behind the shoulder, whatever it is. And so those were the things that jumped out to me, um, you know, right away from him. But uh, I think both guys are going to have an excellent future in the league. Um, but uh, I've certainly been impressed by uh, Trey so far. What's your vision for Keanu Neal and for Randy Gregory? Uh, can you repeat the second player? Uh, Gregor, Randy Gregory. And Got it. Yeah, so let's talk uh, what's the vision and, uh, you know, as we're heading into it with Keanu Neal and with Randy Gregory. So with uh, Kiki, we made the the transition, the biggest one, you know, moving from safety to linebacker. Um, in the system that he was in, he played down by the line of scrimmage a lot. So some of the techniques that he's played at safety were, you know, in the same system, you know, he could have been a linebacker doing that. So uh, we knew he had the, the physicality to play down in the box. And so that was the biggest transition to play inside. And, and the biggest part of that would probably be in the sub packages, you know, the nickel and dime packages. That's where he's so familiar and comfortable with anyway, so a lot of those same roles. And then for Randy, uh, I am so excited to see what he can be, and uh, it's as a featured pass rusher, you know, in our system, and you just can't have enough, you know, from guys on the outside who can cover and pass rushers, like, over and over and over. And uh, I've been impressed by where he's at, mindset, attitude to do it. So um, it's been a good group on the outside, and I'm looking forward to you know, having DeMarcus, you know, join into that group as well, because Bash has been here. I've got the first chance to work with Bradley, but uh, Randy definitely um, has been a guy who's, you know, opened my eyes. Um, you know, kind of like we were talking about with Diggs. Like, I knew he was good. But then when you're, you know, around somebody in a full-time way, you said, there's some special traits there. And uh, that's my role. You know, I want to keep it real with the guys and talk to them in a language to say, hey, man, I want to take from where you're at and get it better. And I think that's what winning football is, when you take a guy from one space and move him to another. And that's going to be the goal with both of those players, to make sure, hey, wherever they're at, I want to hit at them hard and keep it honest and say, this is where we need to go. And I plan on doing that. Um, Coach, when you look at last year, when uh, you evaluate players from last year, how, how do you balance saying, all right, this is what they were asked to do there and looking at some special traits, but knowing that you're probably going to have a different role for them as well. I mean, is there some things that you're looking for that you can tell when you yeah, what's good about that, too, is when you have a, you know, a longer history, um, some of them I saw in college, you know, and so, okay, 
in the evaluation process that they've been part of our system, how would we have used them. Um, and then looking at the calls, you know, you have a good understanding of, you know, how they're playing, what they're playing, and how they would feature them. It's kind of like the uh, why free agency grading is easier than college grading because you're seeing them play against similar people and you have a, you know, a good understanding of the scheme and how they're doing in that. And uh, fortunately for me and for a lot of, you know, people, when you have good players, um, generally they play good in a lot of schemes. <laughs> and uh, so whether they, you know, came in out of college in a 4-3 system and they had, you know, a little bit more 3-4, that's just a matter of training them to get them in that spot. But the traits, that's always what you're looking for, um, the speed, the physicality, the ball skills, those traits, you almost have to look at it as a scout first and say, okay, with those kind of traits, how would they fit into the system? You watch Randy going back to Nebraska. Can you speak to how natural he is as a pass rusher? This is what we've been able to see when he's been on Yeah, I would say um, he's got a rare ability to bend. And, uh, you know, that's unusual, but for a guy who's six, four and a half and you can get on the corner, you know, think of, you know, he has to go against, you know, big tackles here, but this guy can rip on the edge where you have to make the big guys get down and bend to get to him. And so that's a pretty rare trait. You know, there's a lot of guys who can run fast straight ahead and that's good. You know, like as a pass rusher, if you don't have a good get off, it's hard to be a good rusher. He has that. He's got initial quickness, but I think it's his ability to stick his foot in the ground and bend that makes him so unique when it's time to twist and he can bend and get you know outside or inside on a player so um, he's got unique stuff and uh, like I said I'm looking forward to seeing okay here's where we're at and here's where we're trying to get to. Coach, Kelvin Joseph was playing left corner to Sean Wright right corner is that where they'll stay or are they competing in general at corner and we might see him? Yeah, you'll, you'll see him move around and I think um, there may be some times when you want to match up on some people so it's important not just to always, you know, stay at one spot, you know, where Trey might be on this side, he'll go over to the other guy to match on a player. And so AB, um, you'll see him both at corner and at nickel. Um, you'll see Sean um, both sides and Kel as well. So those guys are, they're intermixing now, and uh, that's part of that 40 days, you know, that I was referring to of roles and, you know, how we're going to play. And so until we get closer to those, uh, I'm going to continue to put them into different spaces. Micah told us that your shoe game blows his out of the water. How long have you been wearing the Jordans? Have you talked to Dak at all about being a Jordan brand athlete? I have not, but I am definitely open to um, all conversations about that. Uh, I don't know. Um, a long time, I guess. Well, I grew up, you know, during the you know, 80s where, like, when Jordans came out, it was a big deal. And so um, I love basketball, still love, you know, watching. And so um, that's probably where it started back at, you know, 15 years old. And um, same thing with Run DMC. So same time, same, same moment. Uh, Joseph, he had missed some time. He's quarantined. Doesn't have a lot of college games. Where, where, where is he at right now? Is he a little behind? Is he, like, yeah, I don't think he's behind. And I think um, as a coach, what are you looking? I mean, we only had one practice too, so like you know, there's not you know, ten days for us to have a hey, day one. It was good, but what I would say is um, he came in in excellent shape. And so as a coach, you're always kind of keeping your eye out. You know, what does that first day look like? You know, are they able to finish in that space? And so he was one of the players that I thought really you know demonstrated that speed that he has because it's one thing if you have it but if you're guarded or you're worried about your conditioning you're not ready to open it up and rip it and he was and so that told me this guy's you know put some good work in on the conditioning side and i'm looking forward to seeing where he can go to but i love um you know getting to know him better and building these relationships and the trust takes time you know to to build that it doesn't happen overnight and so he's you know one of the guys that i've enjoyed getting to know better and all these rookies we got to you know 11 of them on the defensive side and getting to know all of them and finding what their roles can be. And they're trying to figure that out too. You know, they all want their shot and going for it, but they're going to get their moments, you know, against the first team. And that's going to happen some in practice where, you know, next guy's going to go in and how are you going to respond and how are you going to play? And so it's not always, you know, backups against backups. I'd like to see put into the fire right away. You want to be down for it? Let's see what it looks like. You guys, you guys, about, you guys got a lot of players, but uh, talk to you know, I, I think uh, I, I probably told you this. What I, what I guess what I learned most about my life, I love doing hard shit with a group of people. I love being at the game, end of the line, right on it. Like, those are my favorite moments. And uh, so to be here is why, um, you know, I was – pumped when Mike, you know, offered me the opportunity to come and join here. I wanted to be a part of this. And uh, so having that chance and getting a chance to work with the guys here, um, it's, it's absolutely, you know, 
where I wanted to be and how I wanted to go after it. And so I um, feel super fortunate to be able to do that, especially in light of, uh, you know, talking about Napper and moments and opportunities and going for it. And so that really hit me this week about, uh, you know, how fortunate I certainly am to be here and part of this organization. Okay, thanks, Coach. All right, you guys have a good one. up right I just gotta bend over <laughs> this is cool it's way better than back at the star in the little room talking to a camera no faces well, can you reflect on your dad and it just who he was and all the well wishes so many people across the league had for your family what they had to say about it yeah um you get me emotional right off the bat huh <laughs> might as well get it out of the way um excuse me if i I break up, need a few minutes, but um, what he meant to me was everything. And growing up, you know, I grew up around football my whole life because when I was born, he was a, actually a player coach for the Hawaii Hawaiians. So um, I spent my whole life in the locker room, on the practice field. I didn't ever go to coaches' meetings because those were boring. I wanted to be around the players. Um, and then just to, I, I knew the impact he had on people, his fellow coaches, his, the players he coached. Um, but you really you got a sense of it when, when he passed, how many people reached out and said how much he meant to them. Um, and then, of course, that's what everybody talks about. But, you know, what he was as a dad was something that, you know, I strive to be as a, as a current coach because it's a lot on your plate. You know, you spend a lot of hours coaching and um, the family time is critical and that's really all you got time for. There's not time really to do anything else and that's okay. Um, you know, he, he tragically passed and it was, you know, the hardest thing I've probably had to go through. Um, and still I'm dealing with it, you know. But, um, and who's going to be here too? Who's going to come to camp? But, Every game day, I call him about four hours before the game. I just say, it's game day, pops. You know, we're going to get him. And he'd respond, you know, just relax and have fun. And so um, I'll miss that, but I'll carry it on and pay it forward. And um, I'll miss him for sure. Around the time that he passed, you were leading a camp of kids, about 100 of them, who have a parent who's incarcerated. Yeah. Talk about passing it on, be it that or just how you coach. What elements of your dad do you, are you passing on? Yeah, um, I think that yeah, the day before he passed, we had a we had a camp at the Star for over a hundred um, kids whose parents were incarcerated. It's the Angel Tree um, camp that's under the Prison Fellowship umbrella that I got I got involved with when I was in LA in 2018. Um, and we bring the kids in and we, we gave them shoes and we gave them an opportunity to come to our facility and we had about 10 of our players show up and help coach along with a lot of other locals and, and former NFL players. Um, and I think those things, you know, back to my dad, I think those things make my dad as proud as anything. You know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't concern himself, he never did concern himself with you know, how I did or how our teams really did but um, the impact we had on other people. And I think that's something that I'll always carry with me is paying forward the, the opportunities I had as a kid around football um, and trying to give that back to some other kids who maybe didn't have some of the opportunities that I did. Um, and ironically, that was, that was the day before. There's no good transition from that to football, but ball security is one of the things that you oversaw last year. Is that something you'll be overseeing this year too? And Zeke talked a lot about it yesterday. If so, how do you want to hone in on it during? 
Yeah, I think we, we, we made a pretty good emphasis of it last year. And I think you saw the, the fruits of the labor later in the season. And so our goal is to pick up where we ended last season, where I believe, and I think Coach McCarthy would attest that we got better holding on to the football. We got better taking the football away. And we're going to spend a lot of time of it. We spend nine minutes at the start of every practice on ball security, emphasis, catching the football, taking the football away. Um, and so Coach McCarthy put me in charge of, you know, installing those things in the, in the team meetings and then organizing it and running the drills at practice. And I think it's excellent because I've never been a part of a team that spent that much time in meetings and on the practice field just working on fundamentals. And we'll do it all season long. Um, and I think it's going to win us football games. Why the change in long snapper? Um, I think because there was multiple guys that were undrafted or, or unrestricted free agents, including LP. And obviously the relationship I had with Jake McQuaid for not eight years and with the Rams played a big part of it. Um, Jake is somebody that I think is one of the best. I've thrown everything at him in practice and he's handled it. I think he's a great pro in the locker room. I have a huge amount of respect for LP, um, and he probably has more ball left in him. I think Jake's got a lot of ball left in him, and so I think he's somebody that hopefully we can keep around here for a lot of years and keep playing at a high level. And clearly the, the relationship I had with him and the confidence I had in him working with him for so long had a huge part of it. Concerned are you about Zerline? Zerline's coming off minor back surgery. How concerned are you that you – you're going to get him at some point this summer. Yeah, I'm not concerned. We've been through it before with him, you know, with a, with a low back, and then years before that, a groin, and he's a true pro. You know, um, Britt and our training staff has done amazing working all summer with him. So hopefully he'll be ready in a couple weeks. Hopefully he'll get a preseason game in, and then no doubt with his experience, he'll be ready for, for week one. What makes a good long snapper other than just getting the ball back to it, you know, quickly and all that? Is there is there more to it than that? Running down, making you know tackles, or you know, understanding the schemes, the blocking, and all that? Yeah, I think that's that's a great question, and I think people think of snapping as throwing the football back, and that really is like a prerequisite. You got to be able to fire the football back in you know 0.75 seconds or whatever people want. Um, but to me, what makes a great long snapper is what happens after he throws the football back in the pro football. The number one requ requirement is being able to protect, you know, um, when it's a pressure and teams are so good at disguising pressures and so knowing which way to slide, how to recover. I mean, there's so many intricate details of long snapping that you just can't see if you're sitting in the stands or if you're not watching the end zone coaches copy tape what happens. Um, so the biggest thing is what happens after the snap. This is just my opinion on the line of scrimmage when it comes to punt protection or recognizing a return happening and being able to pick for guards. And, and then to me, it's the secondary thing is, is the cover. Because the snapper's goal, at least for us, is to free up some of the, the real tacklers and let those guys go. And um, so it's a, it's a lot of dirty work that doesn't get recognized. But when you watch the coach's end zone copy, there's a lot on the plate for long snappers, which is probably why you don't see a lot of young guys every year. You see long snappers that are snapping into the year 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, because there's a comfort level you have with them in protection. Because it's not easy for college kids because they're not punt protecting in college anymore. The rules are different, so they snap and go. And so to learn NFL punt pros is tough. Jake wears a blue jersey. Does he, does he still feel, does he feel himself as a linebacker or something? Yeah. Defense? When he first got here, he had a white jersey on. And I said, I I, you know, he didn't feel comfortable in that because he's, he's a defensive mentality guy. So we asked our equipment guys to go to a blue jersey, and they obliged, and Jake felt better. Do you think he pulled bags and drills for defensive guys? Is that his idea, or are you just telling him to keep busy in practice? For Jake you're talking about? Yeah, Jake wants to be a part of the linebacker and defensive line drills because it's just an opportunity for some individual for him. So some of those drills that linebackers and D-line do carry over to some long snapping as far as the picking, the protection, the using of the hands, getting off blocks. So um, it's both of our ideas to throw him in some of those individual drills just to get some more work with big bodies to go against. What do you think the possibilities are with C.D. Lamb as, as a returner? I mean, obviously he's a dynamic player, but specifically as, as a punt returner, what, what can he bring to you guys? Yeah, I expect him to bring a lot. He's a great ball catcher, so... It's a huge comfort level as a coach knowing that you got a guy back there with great 
ball skills, but also decision making. And he's always had that. Um, and then he's really damn good with the football in his hands. And I think there's some, some strides we can make, personally speaking, more than anything, with the punt return schematics and plan that we, we've tweaked a little bit and we're going to be working really hard on it. actually starting tomorrow. Tomorrow's our first punt return install day in training camp. And um, it's going to be revolved around what we think CD is good at. And so our schematics are going to be driven to, to hopefully accentuate his strengths. Is that part of a broader year two ability where you have a better feel as a coach of your personnel than this time last year you hadn't even been on the field with them? Uh, what, what does year two look like in terms of being able to scheme better to the talent that you have? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's huge because we didn't have any OTAs last year, even with the vets. And then in training camp, I was, I was shaking hands and introducing myself to, to all the guys in training camp last year. So just getting a feel for, um, for strengths, not really concerned about the weaknesses, but getting a feel for strengths and um, trying to build what we do around that. And we, we don't have a special teams playbook. And I've done that now for about the last 12 years. We don't have a playbook because it depends on who we have. So we structure what we do around who we have. And so we kind of did that this year. We don't have a playbook, but we have a plan as far as what we want to do. And we're going to drill the hell out of the things that will go into the schematics when we get to the regular season. But um, having a feel for not only the returners, but the blockers and what they're good at, you know, helps us come up with plans for games, for sure. John, I know you've got over a month left of training camp, so you've got time, but do you expect to have Jeopardy again this year? And oh, so, yeah. I mean, do you start planning that already? Oh, yeah. Do we start planning that? A, while, a while ago. That's, that's one of those February, March projects where it's a little bit slower and, you know, we have a little fun and get ahead. So we're, we're about two questions away from filling out our 30 question and hopefully sometime next week we'll have it. What went into the decision to have Hunter handling the punting and kicking duties instead of a Brian Anger and Greg's absence? Yeah, Hunter will handle for sure the, the kicking off and the field goal kicking and Hunter will have a huge you know, opportunity for the punting, and we'll get Brian some reps. It'll just be, it'll be discussed, you know, the week leading into every preseason game, how many we want him to get. Um, but Hunter knows that he's got to have a, a live leg and a fresh leg ready to hit a lot of balls, not only in practice, but also in games. And What do you feel this will do for him if he doesn't stick here, but just being able to showcase his versatility for the other 31 clubs? I think that's it, just an opportunity to showcase. And, and really, he had... He might have had what, seven games, eight games last year where he really did a pretty darn good job coming off the street. You know, he wasn't with the club. So handling the operation and some calls he had to make, and um, he did pretty darn good. And this is just an opportunity for him to get more reps. But I also think it's valuable for a punter to show you can kick off because there's quite a few teams who have older kickers who can't or don't want to kick off anymore. And so there's value in a punter who can also kick off, and Hunter has that ability. So I'm excited to see what he can do. Adjustments to, to making the, the fake punts this year that different than he did last year? Yeah, make them work, really. <laughs> um, but I will say there's, there's always something that, that's positive coming from calling a fake punt. You know, the antennas definitely go up on the punt return team the more you do it. And so um, we're aware that the antennas are always up when we play, we play a team. Um, and so I just got to keep digging and diving harder to find the simple, simple ways to get us first downs when we do call a fake punt. Because I think that's, that's part of our punt fabric is having the ability to, to run three or four fakes a season, to gain first downs, but also put some more questions in the punt return team's mind. Um, and we called quite a few more than three fakes last year. We just we killed some of them because we didn't get the right look. Talk to Mike beforehand. I mean, how does that go on, on, a, on a game day like this? Yeah, it, it, you know, during the week we talk about it, and we say, okay, if we're in this situation, um, this quarter, this fourth and distance, the score, then we'll consider it. And so, usually between series, you know, based on what we think we need or what the punt return team's doing, we'll say, hey, we like it, we don't like it, and then when the decision's made to do it, it's it's usually within about five seconds, or you know, we talk about it green light by the head coach or red light by the head coach, and then I got to call it, and we, and we run it and live with it. Um, but there's some, definitely some things that, that I can do to, to put us in the best position to run it and successfully execute it, 
or kill it and don't run it even though it's been called. So those mechanisms are in place and um, those are things that I can do better to make sure that we get out of it if it ain't good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody.